Welcome, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, I am Shimul Sachdeva, an engineering manager on the personal safety team here at Uber. And for the next 10 minutes, I'm going to talk about a case study on how we are using technology to keep Uber safe for cash rides. So let me start with a little bit about myself. I uh, am originally from India. I studied in India, Singapore, and then California, uh, and then spent early part of my career at Microsoft, followed by coming back to California to join Uber, which brings me to here. So before I dive into our cash world, I want to step back and talk a little bit about what the safety team does and what, why we exist. This is a screen that shows you some kind of high level numbers. We have about 40 million riders today on our platform and 2 million drivers. We're in over 70 countries and we're doing on average 10 million trips a day. In fact, the last I heard was 14 million. What you see on the screen is a lot of millions. And when you have a lot of millions, the one in a million problem starts to happen a lot. And that's where we, the safety team, come in to figure out how we can use data as well as technology to mitigate some of these risks. So with that context in mind, let me zoom in on cash. Dimesh kind of alluded to this in, uh, in his talk just now about why cash is important for us. So I want to start off with giving a little more context on that. Let's do a quick poll, a show of hands, um, or if people can shout out numbers. How many, what percentage of people do you think in the world use credit or debit cards today? Any guesses? One, five, three, zero, okay. Five, zero. All right, good guesses. You're the closest. In 2014, only 23% of the world had used a debit or credit card. And this number hasn't moved all that dramatically fast forward to today. In the US alone, 26% of people who've been polled on average, according to the US World Bank, prefer to use cash for non-billed transactions. Now, if you step outside of the US, in other markets, credit card penetration is even lower. And in some countries like India and Brazil, they're actually seen as risky or expensive. So this is the world we live in today. And so the answer of why cash is important to our business is because it's a big customer need. And so Uber took that as an opportunity and launched cash to provide access to all of these users who were hurting for it. What we found, though, was that even though this was great for Uber's business, it, it brought to light certain needs that emerged in terms of safety. Specifically, there were two main needs that emerged. The first one is rider anonymity. Now, when you have a credit card or some kind of digital payment profile, we know inherently that there is some financial bank or institution out there that has verified you. So in the absence of that, we suddenly have this issue of a rider, of a rider and rider's identity being anonymous. So the first problem we needed to attack was reducing rider anonymity. The second issue that became very clear to us was driver control. As you, as you can imagine, when we expanded Uber's business by cash, Uber was suddenly operating in newer geographic areas. And so we were kind of taking our drivers and forcing them to go out of their you know, usual territories into newer markets, arguably with different socioeconomic statuses. What that resulted in was drivers who were anxious, who were scared while, while getting onto the road to pick up these cash riders. So what I'm going to talk about next is how we kind of took these two problems and built in-app experiences to mitigate them. And we'll talk a little bit also about uh, the back end that supports both of these. OK, so first, rider anonymity. The main market where this was the biggest issue was Brazil. Brazil is one of the fastest growing markets in Latin America. Cash, and with cash specifically, it is, people just love cash in Brazil. So we you know, flew down to Brazil. We talked to a bunch of riders and drivers trying to figure out what our options were uh, in order to get a measure of a rider's identity in the absence of a credit card. We have explored a bunch of vendors, a bunch of uh, different options, digital as well as analog. And what we landed on is what we call CPF. So CPF is the same as an SSN in the US. Essentially, it's their government's national ID for their citizens. Um, and what we did was we partnered with a third party vendor called ACI to allow cash riders to verify their identity using CPF as well as a date of birth before they take a trip. 
And with the success we saw, um, and, and, and to be clear, the success was both in terms of reducing rider risk, but also driver sentiment went up because drivers started to trust the cash riders a lot more. Um, so seeing the success in Brazil, we wanted to take it further and make it global. Now, one roadblock we ran into while making it global, and by global I mean into other cash markets, was that national IDs aren't exactly a scalable way to go beyond and kind of be global. Uh, the reason is not every country has a national ID. In some cases, you know, the governments came to us asking for us to build national IDs because they didn't have one. Um, and it, also because it's highly fragmented as a market. So we'll have to potentially go to multiple vendors and, and keep maintenance in these relationships, not to mention business contracts and money. So we switched from analog to understand what other options exist. And we explored a few digital um, identity vendors. And where we landed was Facebook. Facebook is actually fairly ubiquitous. It, is very, it has high penetration in a lot of these countries, including our cash heavy markets. And so we set out to do Facebook verification for cash riders and works very similarly. When you take a cash trip, you, can, you are forced into doing a Facebook verification if, it, if you don't have a credit card. And uh, we call the Facebook API to do a verification. Now let's talk a little bit about how this architecture works in the backend and how it has evolved um, over time to support the, the use cases. So where we started off was fairly simple. We had the entry point, which was the CPF flow. We had the, uh, the mobile app essentially would talk to our gateway, which is a single uh, microservice that can handle kind of all inbound from the mobile app. And then we built a microservice specifically for our use case along with uh, a database. And we also had a partnership with a third-party vendor to build the end-to-end -end validation. Then we expanded on top of that and added a vendor uh, as long with a new entry point with the main uh, backend uh, microservice system remaining the same. Then came along uh, another use case for us where we had to start verifying cash riders in two different entry points, not just on cash request trips, but further ahead of the funnel in onboarding to reduce the, the friction. Beyond that, we started to launch Eats with cash. And so the Eats team came to us and we're like, well, let's build an integration for Eats. We then moved on to the Eats website, then m.uber. And as you can imagine, further from there. So one thing we quickly realized was that instead of building UI components for each of those entry points, we needed to build something more scalable that would work for other entry points as well that we currently don't have or can't envision yet. So what we did was switched into an async model where instead of the entry points calling us, we had a single source of truth where we would pipe our data, our data being a Boolean essentially of whether a rider is verified or not, and any new entry point integrating with that system. All right, so the next thing I wanna talk about is the giving drivers control. So giving drivers control has two main pieces. One is transparency and the other is tools. With transparency, what we wanted to do was show our drivers that we care and empower them with the information to make the right decision for themselves. The way we did that was we told them whether a particular trip was a cash trip or not. We also told them whether a particular rider was verified or not. What this, this did was give them that freedom to choose whether they wanna accept a particular trip or not. In addition, we also gave them an ability to give feedback. So when they do cancel a trip because of safety concerns, we wanted to make sure we were capturing that information. And lastly, we've created tools to give them peace of mind. One thing that became very clear when we uh, flew to Brazil and talked to these drivers was that these drivers were, were hurting for peace of mind. What they, and they actually had WhatsApp groups that they had created among driver, other drivers to tell them about uh, dangerous locations if they were entering a dangerous location uh, and ask them to check back on them um, if they don't hear back. So we heard this need loud and clear. And what we did was built a way for them to share their location seamlessly from the app. So what they have now is through their uh, home map view, they have a one tap option to share their location uh, with loved ones um, with just as easy as a tap. On the recipient side, the recipient gets a push notification they can tap into that and see where the driver is in real time. They can also see state changes as the driver changes locations. In addition, we also have a desktop view, just in case the recipient doesn't have uh, the rider, Helix, the, what we call Helix, the rider app installed on their phones. 
All right, so quickly, how the back end of that works. All right, so at the very onset, we have the driver sending an intent to share. We capture the intent in a microservice and then use that intent to send a push notification to the recipient. The recipient, when they click on it, calls the recipient tracker, which then aggregates this information from other different microservices and business platforms within the Uber system. And then finally, we also listen to active trip state changes to notify back to the recipient on any state changes for the driver. Oh, and by the way, this is exactly how Share My ETA works on the rider side as well. It's the same backend system that is doing the magic. All right, so with that, I want to wrap up and hopefully, you know, this was a good quick 10 minute window into how safety works at Uber with a case study. And I uh, thank you again for listening in. And I, I hope the next time you take an Uber, you know that there are engineers out there trying to make sure that you are safe. Thank you.